So we talked uh, before uh, HS biosynthetic pathways and the defect in the enzyme that makes this HS change that causes the undergrowth or overgrowth uh, in humans. So these enzymes are very critical and so they have a normal growth. So like why there's so many enzymes involved in breaking these molecules and uh, including glycosidases and sulfatases like glycosyl transferases, sulfur transferases which transfer carbohydrates and sulfate to the molecules to make protoglycans. Then we have glycosidases and sulfatases which start cleaving these molecules uh, one at a time uh, uh, from uh, exo in the exo manner from non-reducing in towards the reducing in. And all these enzymes are localized in the lysosome like a synthetic enzymes localized in the Golgi. These biodegradable enzymes are located in the uh, <coughs> lysosomes and where this molecule has to get in and get broken down because this molecule is constantly made and constantly broken down. So defect in the HS catabolic enzymes or the chondritis sulfate or other enzymes results in accumulation of these molecules in lysosomes. When they get the signal, okay, now it's time for them to go and get distracted so they get the signaling and they go to the lysosomes but the enzyme is absent so what they do, they're just going to stay there. So then <coughs> Then they constantly get accumulated lysosomes. So eventually what happens, the lysosome gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So then that leads to a disease. This is collectively called lysosomal storage disorder. It doesn't matter which enzyme is absent. And the way the enzyme works, that it works one at a time. So even one enzyme is absent, then they end up in accumulating all of the structures. For example, And so this is the NS, and uh, say this is the sixes, and it continues like this. And uh, so now you have the NS sulfamidase enzyme is missing. What happens that the structure will accumulate like this, and so then the two S enzyme, two S sulfatase. cannot act on this one. The only enzyme can act on this structure, 6 or sulfatase and sulfatase, which is called sulfamidase. Then this is 6 or sulfatase. So if you have a 6 or sulfatase enzyme is absent, then the 2 or sulfatase cannot work here because only enzymes can act upon on this structure is this and then this, and also an enzyme called alpha n acetyl glucosaminidase, uh, which would clean the entire unit, and then this would become a terminal residue, and then 2 s sulfatase enzyme can act on that. So until this residue becomes a terminal residue, this enzyme cannot act upon. So suppose your 2 s sulfatase enzyme is missing. So you have a 2 s enzyme is missing, you don't have that enzyme. So what happens is that the sulfamidase, 6 sulfamidase cannot act on that because this is the terminal residue and you have to remove the terminal residue first before you start working on the next residue. So all these enzymes, uh, glucosaminidase, iodinidase, and glycosaminidase, uh, uh, and also like 6 sulfamidase, 2 sulfamidase, they all work uh, from terminal residue, they can only work on terminal residue, so even one enzyme is absent, then you may only do two or three reactions of okay, cleaving it like desulfation, when it comes to the next residue, it stops completely, so basically you have 50 repeating disaccharide unit, then you can probably remove only one monosaccharide unit, depending on which enzyme is absent, so you end up in having 49 disaccharide repeating will still be accumulated plus another one terminal residue, so the consequence is that it doesn't matter which enzyme is absent, all these structures get accumulated. In the case of aldohanidase enzyme, which is expressed only, found only in HS and the DS, and those two molecules will accumulate. In the case of 6 of sulfatase, which is found, of course, in, uh, in heparan sulfate and chondritis sulfate, but this enzyme is very specific for n glucosamine 6 of sulfatase, which causes some filiform disease, a D type D. So there are a number of enzymes, their absence is linked to a specific disease, and uh, 
So all of them is collectively called lysosomal storage disorders. There are slightly differences in the phenotypical outcome, but the major phenotype and people, uh, children who have this disease is that they are mentally retarded. It's a progressive disease. They are mentally retarded, and also they're physically deformed. Okay, their bone growth and everything is okay screwed up. And so, what is an option exist for them? The enzyme replacement therapy. So the children, the earlier they diagnosed, they can start giving them enzymes. But also now some of the diseases, not for all of them. And uh, uh, we have bone marrow transplant is available, but they have to wait in line until they find the right match uh, donor. Then they can accept. Then it helps them to improve their lifestyle. But until then, uh, they need to be on enzyme replacement therapy. But oftentimes the problem is that it is not visible until uh, the baby is two years and three years old, and by then it's too late. If someone is predicted to be having this genetic disease, then if we can diagnose very early on, as soon as the baby is born, then the recovery is much, much, much better. They can live longer and also have a better quality of life. But the diagnosis happens only when the child is not developing normally, which becomes more obvious after age one and age two. Then you go and see a pediatrician, then they start doing diagnostic tools and everything they apply and figuring out. Then by then it's already late, unfortunately. So because the mental, the brain development all happens the first two years in your life. So, and that's when all this action, guidance, and wiring and all takes place. It's all related by proteoglycans, a heparin sulfate, chondritin, dimethyl sulfate, and these enzymes all made and get cleared constantly. So now this molecule accumulate and it has an effect in signaling pathway that leads to yeah, mental okay, okay, retardation, retardations, mental health, but that cannot be fixable later in life. And so the, the sooner you diagnose, the better the life quality for the child is going to be and by giving bone marrow transplant. And also that until that point you have to give enzyme replacement therapy. But it was detected later on in life, left untreated the die very engaged. Of course, once you diagnose the child with this problem, age two or age three, they are by then mentally retarded, but they can still live until depending on the severity of the disease and also depending on which enzyme is absent. Some enzymes are really, really difficult uh, that have more consequences than other diseases, okay? other enzymes absent. So they are anywhere between age 8 and age of 38 to 40, like not 40, okay, like 25 to 30. By then they just, they have other complications arises. So until that point you try to give them enzyme replacement therapy. But the problem is that these enzymes are produced, even though in mammalian cells, those structures are different than humans. And so it generates antibodies. Now also some companies trying to express this enzyme in human cell lines. We have humanized cell lines available and also by adding some enzyme um, glycosyl transferases to make these enzymes more look like a human enzyme, but they still produce antibodies that have to increase the dosage and so forth. And then of course eventually they can go for bone marrow transplant, but by then the damage is caused, but they can live that with the deficit they have to okay, live with that. So this tells you again how important these molecules are, both synthesis and metabolism. They are all very tightly regulated. In the absence of that, I think it has huge consequences. So this slide shows about the children who suffer from that, uh, specific syndromes. And now let's move on into the biosynthesis of heparin sulfate. There are so many enzymes involved uh, in making these molecules. Uh, and also keep in mind these enzymes exist in multiple isoforms. Uh, for example, NDST, which stands for N-D-S-L-A-S-E, n transferase. This is a bifunctional enzyme which does both deacylation and n sulfation of uh, the glucosamine residue. It's a bifunctional enzyme which exists in four isoforms, NDST1, 2, 3, and 4. And each isoform have different uh, kinetic rates for deacylation and n sulfation because this bifunctional enzyme it does both deacylation and n sulfation and don't think that all these enzymes can equally deacylate and equally n sulfate. Some isoforms I don't quite remember, but some isoforms have a propensity to do deacylation much rapidly than the n sulfation. So that may perhaps explain why sometimes when you isolate gag chain from tissues or some cells, they have some free amines. It is not that you don't have any free amine. You have a free amine, you have an N sulfate, you have N acetyl groups. So when you have one of the isoform expressed which has a more propensity for deacylation than N sulfation, we end up in having gag chain, HS chain with free amine containing gag chains. And some 
uh, NDS enzymes have a very high, okay, equal amount of NDST and insulfation activity, deacylation and insulfation. So NDST2 isoform, which we use in our lab routinely because it has both equal activity for deacylation and insulfation. So when you use this enzyme, uh, you can do equally deacylation and as fast as do we do. Of course, I do deacylation first, then you can do insulfation. So you do deacylation first and then you do insulfation. But you don't have to wait for too long to do deacylation and then insulfation. So this bifunctional enzyme NDST isoform 2 has equal activity for deacylation and insulfation and that's the primary reason why we use this enzyme in our lab. So which converts the glucosamine, uh, NS glucosamine into N-sulfur glucosamine. And uh, so this n sulfation is required for converting glucuronic acid into iodinic acid in which the C5 epimer is epimerized from glucose to iodo. And then once you get them into iodinic acid, then all of the enzymes can start acting upon this molecule. The 2-OST obviously can sulfate, preferentially iodinic acid, one, two position, and uh, whereas this 2 OST can also sulfate glucuronic acid, but less preferentially. It prefers iodine. If there's a choice between glucose and iodo, it will choose iodo, 2 OST enzyme. And uh, so 3 OST1 specifically sulfates the 3 position of the glucosamine, and 6 OST specifically sulfates the 6 position of glucosamine. And 6 OST isoform exists in 3 isoforms 6 OST1, 2, and 3. And 6 OST isoform has 2 splice variants. In the case of 3-OST, which carries out 3 uh, sulfation of glucosamine, even though this modification, 3 sulfation is a rare modification, it exists as many as 6 isoforms in humans. In zebra fish, 7 or 8, how many? 8, yeah. So they keep adding, okay? next month I asked Joe, will say 9, next month will be 10, okay? And uh, when I came to Utah, they said it's a 4, then it's a 5, then 6, and then 7, now they have 8. And uh, so the 3 OST, surprisingly, even though it carries out a rare modification, it exists in as many isoforms as no other enzymes. And surprisingly, it's a rare modification, but it exists in multiple isoforms. It's possible, that's why people speculated, maybe it does some very fine and rare modification, but those modifications can be only catalyzed by one isoform, but not the other isoform, to generate a sequence, to generate a structure, and that have a specific biological function. And also some of the isoforms are expressed only during development, embryogenesis, but then they get silenced, they are not expressed again. They are transcriptionally regulated during embryogenesis. Maybe this enzyme is required to make specific modification to trigger the heart development, maybe lung development. Because once heart is formed, a lung is formed, you don't need this enzyme anymore. Because this enzyme is required to absolutely make a specific modification, and that modification may trigger the signaling event, and that results in forming the heart. Once the heart is formed, you don't, you may not need that. So that could be as simple reason as why some of the enzyme isoform expressed during early development and then turned off later on in life. You don't need that. And maybe turned on, uh, maybe in some cancers, and uh, that's why explains happen is it's not desecrated. And also not only that, and also Cialidase enzyme or Cialid transplase, some of the enzymes are expressed only during early development. And then reappears only in, uh, for example, in Wilms tumor, uh, once the transfer is expressed uh, in early development, then it's completely shut down during adulthood. And then it reappears in Wilms tumor, which causes a kidney tumor. And uh, one of the enzymes called, I think, sialic acid alpha-1,8 transferase, which is completely absent in adulthood, and then it again reappears. So it's possible that some of the three ways to forms, and if it's absent or silent, maybe it has some huge effect later in life. But it's definitely required. But surprisingly, the C5 epimerase, all the isoform exists in multiple isoform. NDST, 6-OST, 3-OST, even, even the EXT polymerase exists in two isoform, EXT1, EXT2. They also have a variance called EXTL1, EXTL2. They all contribute towards making linkage region and also facilitate uh, EXT1 to function more efficiently. So you have multiple isoforms exist for even polymerases. That's the same case for chondritin synthesis. But C5 epimerase, for heparin sulfide, only one isoform exists, okay? For heparin sulfide, C5 epimerase, is only one isoform exists. Of course, for chondritin sulfide, also we have another isoform, which can also chondritin sulfide into dermatin sulfide, which is different C5 epimerase. With respect to heparin sulfide, this C5 epimerase, is the only enzyme, it does not have any other isoform. And likewise, the 2 OST also exists, okay, only enzyme for heparin sulfate. We call this 2 OST1 
because it's too HT1 is specific for heparin sulfide. They thought that there's some splice variants and maybe some other isoforms. But it's given name 2HT1, but it just stuck to that name 2HT1. But it doesn't have any other isoforms as far as I know in humans. And for heparin sulfide, you have a epimerase, a single isoform, 2HT1. For heparin sulfide, is one isoform. There is 2HT2, which was given name in, when the paper was published, and the 2HT2 was committed to do 2 sulfation of hydronic acid found in dermatan sulfate to make dermatan sulfate. That was given name 2 h 2 And they thought that they will eventually found c for for, okay, then maybe other isoforms. And that's when these papers all came out, NDST2, 6-OST, and 3-OST isoforms. They thought when the 2-OST were found, it's like maybe it's a 2-OST1, it's the first gene for heparin sulfate. But it's the only genes available as far as I know. I don't know that's true for zebra fish or not. I think there's two. Two? For ephemeris? Only one, right? Okay. So, surprisingly, if you may some two ways, you like isoforms are more restricted, whereas other, iso other enzymes exist in many isoforms. So that may also can control the rate of reactions and hence the sulfation pattern and so forth, one of the questions asked. And those things, we can control it, but maybe these enzymes can form different complexes and hence make the different structures. So this slide basically summarizes how different sulfur transfers exist, okay, isoforms, and also their localization and where they're located, and some, play, some, uh, some of the enzymes are broad, some of the enzymes are very specific, and they're located only in specific places in the tissues and humans. And now let us just start focusing on how each of the modifications happens. So ring sulfation is required for CFP isn't? and CFP is required for two waste modifications. And all those things that we know, that's why infiltration has always been considered as a gateway modification. So then we recently, in our lab, we found that Karthik and Tau, that they can take a 6 o sulfated polysaccharide, 6 o sulfated, and they treat it with the NDST enzyme. It converts the n acetyl glucosamine. So the conventional wisdom is that, okay, and if you take this molecule, and treat the NDST enzyme, and this residue should not be sul uh, n sulfated, it cannot, should not undergo n deacylation and n sulfation, and uh, this should not happen. And uh, so when you take this molecule, you get two disaccharides, NS6S and NS12S. And this NS12S, okay, which is here, okay, this is NS and this NS6S, because we use radio labeling, we can see the 6 o radio labeled, so you can see these two disaccharides, is the NS. Uh, which is also already labeled, I think, okay, NS, and this NS6 is already labeled. So then you have this polymer, when you cleave them, you get the two polysaccharides, and ns 6s and you have NS6s. So this is NS12-6s, and this NS6s, and this again 6 is already labeled. And uh, so you see that. And then when treated with NDST enzyme, this peak disappears. It's still there, a small amount, but pretty much it disappears. I, I think it's 11 minutes, it's a, it's a different peak. So this one disappears and it becomes this. So that convinced that the n astral 6s is a substrate for NDST enzyme, it becomes ns 6 That means that the NDST reaction not only is a gateway modification it can carry out, and it's not necessarily a gateway modification, it can also participate later on in the basmati pathway to do more trimming and okay, means more, modul okay, more modifications to do what we call is a maturation process. So the first modification without any O-sulfation is considered as a gateway modification. Any modification you do have to O-sulfation, which we call maturation process, and they can come back, these enzymes, and can make more N-sulfated uh, residues and enhance more sulfate-dense rich regions, possibly. And uh, then it is known that c epimerase cannot act upon the chain of true sulfation and also c epimerase cannot act upon the chain without any sulfation and that's why when the question asked if this sequence is right, the sequence is right because c epimerase cannot act without any sulfation and also c epimerase cannot act on the chain of true sulfation. Any O sulfation can inhibit the vicinity of the c epimerase action site. The, the proximal to the c epimerase action site, if you have any O sulfation, 6-O sulfation, 3-O sulfation, or 2-O sulfation, it will inhibit the action of c epimerase. And therefore, c epimerase has to act on the chain before O sulfation at that specific site, the site where you want the modifications. So that's why we use the sequence of n sulfation and c epimerase and 2-OST, then 6-O and 3-O happening onwards. So what we found that 
this is true the CFO minutes cannot act upon the O sulfated residues, but the NDST can still act upon the O sulfated residues. That means that NDST is the earliest enzyme. It cannot be inhibited by the later enzyme that act upon making O-sulfation, whereas the intermediate enzyme CFA primarase can still be inhibited. So this is, I think, a novel finding, and so that opens our understanding about, so, so new knowledge that we generated, so it makes us to think more carefully what is exactly happening in the biosynthetic pathway. So the another one uh, is very critical to understand that when you convert the glutaronic acid to acid, acids epimerized by the enzyme, and historically, people, what they do, they take this substrate, N-sulfated precursor, N-sulfated, because otherwise CFA primaries cannot act upon. They treat with radiation, okay, radiated, uh, heavy water, treated water, tritium water, okay? And then we look out for how much tritium is incorporated later on after, like, washing and isolating the DAE, which we're going to do today, and making them bind to DAE column and wash it and elute it, and then you quantitate the radioactivity of the precursors that incorporating. So based on that, you can say, well, this is enzyme is active. This can convert the CFA uh, glucuronic acid into hydronic acid, and that's how. But it is not very quantitative. And uh, so then we decided to just, instead of using treated water, we want to use a deuterium water. And uh, so then we can use a MOSFET. And what we did that, we took the polymers, and it was developed by Bob in the lab, the previous postdoc. And it's a very nice work. But we do that, we take this polymer, n sulfated polymer, and uh, uh, which is prepared from heparin. You take the heparin, you can strip all the sulfate groups, and all the sulfate groups, and then it has both glucose and iodine. Of course, iodine is a major component, glucuronic acid is a minor component. And then you treat it with low pH nitrous acid, it gives you two disaccharides, glucuronic acid and anhydromanose, hydronic acid and anhydromanose. We can also think about why we're not using heparin lysis. We talked about heparin lysis yesterday when we came and did some experiments. We take the polymer, take the heparin lysis, it gives a diet, attracts, act, and so forth. But when we do that, the critical stereochemical information is lost because it generates a double bond. So if you're making disaccharides with a double bond, there is no stereochemistry there. So then we do not know whether it's a glucose or iodine. And also tritium will be lost, and deuterium will be lost. So when we do nitrous acid, it preserves uh, the stereochemical information on the glucose iodine, which is nice. And that's why people often, when they want to quantitate the epimer content, okay, epimer content in the chain, they do nitrous acid first, and then they look out for glucose iodine they can quantitate. But you know how they quantitate? It has to be radio labeled. And remember, this N sulfate is gone. There's no, there's no sulfation now. And you know, glucose, anodomanos, iodine, anodomanos. They use a carbon-14 labeled. Are uh, treated labeled uh, HS precursors. They treat with epimerase, uh, and uh, then they will do nitrous acid treatment. And then we have to spot on a paper chromatography, paper, uh, which you did from the NADIN test. Or which test you did on a paper? Did for yesterday. Glucnac, NADIN test, right? NADIN test, Glucnac, and uh, so use NADIN test like you, you do a paper chromatography and cellulose plate. Likewise, and for these two molecules to be separated, you have to use not this tiny paper, okay, chromatography. You have to use four feet paper. And you have to run for two days. And you need to have a tank of isopropanol and water and acetic acid. And you just spot it heavily and then just go home for two days or go for hiking, okay? And <laughs> come back two days later and you have to dry it, okay? And this is what people do in olden days. I'm not joking. And Jerry, uh, Jeremiah Silber, okay, he was the one who was working with Conrad Silber for a long time in the 1960s. I was visiting his okay, hospital, he was a faculty in the VA hospital back in Boston, okay, when he was still active. And he showed me all these tanks, okay, yes, there was a retirement symposium for in honor of his okay, work. So I went, okay, we had to pass by the lab to go to the big, nice hall where he had a, a symposium. I was passing by, I asked him, all these things tanks are. I asked him what they are for. They said, this is for paper chromatography. I was like, going inside, what is this? <laughs> it's a deep well, OK? And they have all this acetic acid and sodium hydroxide, not like small bottles, buckets, OK? Then I realized, oh my god. So this is how they're able to quantitate glucose iodine 
book and the long paper, okay, chronography, like four feet tall. And you're done with like only four inch, that you think is very funny. Think about four feet. And so that's how in the olden days with no NMR, no mass pack, and the quantitative is like phenomenal, okay, efforts required by those scientists in those days without any, okay, hard work and the imagination. And uh, so now we have all these fancy tools uh, to do more. Uh, and uh, so, so the Bob in my lab, when he did that, okay, well, fantastic, okay. So we have an ion pairing agent called, okay, diabetic ammonium acetate that we use for LCMS conditions. Then when he took the heparin, I mean, I want to make sure that we, can, we like to do the deuterium inf information uh, nicely by using the mass spec LCMS. And uh, so before we go, we like to do the heparin polymer. So when we did that, and we didn't expect to see two peaks because no one has reported they can use a column chromatography here, HPLC. The reason why people have to go through that way, even now, HPLC cannot separate this two disaccharide at least until now. And so that's why people have to go through even now, like 2004 and 5, I've seen people doing super chromatography back in the hospital in Boston and also in Uppsala too. And uh, so, so this HPLC technology has developed in which we can see, and this is a gluco, it's a completely desulfated and sulfated heparin. This is a glucuronic acid and this iodonic acid. As we expected, glucose would be less than around 30% or 40 less than that, ironic as dominant, so we can see the two peaks. So when we saw these two peaks, we were very surprised, because we expect to see only one peak. I want to make sure it's all working well, so we can go and look for the deuterated and the non-deuterated species we can calculate. But we saw two peaks, so it's a bonus for us, so we can see that we can resolve the epimer content, is fantastic. And then we can take the K5MS, which is n sulfated heparosome precursor, which is not epimerized, and uh, so then we saw only a single peak, so that's how we were able to confirm that this is a glucose, this is iodine, and this is a glucuronic acid, and this is iodonic acid, and we, we confirmed by using m sulfur heparosome. So then we, then we use this knowledge and take this polymer, n sulfur heparosome, treat with enzymes in D2O, and treat with the D2O enzyme uh, in, the, in D2O. What happens is that the glucuronic acid uh, becomes iodonic acid, plus it also had inverse configuration, peaks of proton, not proton, deuterium from solvent. So now we deuterated. And also keep in mind, this reaction is reversible. This is the only enzyme I know that is reversible in okay, nature, uh, at least in the HSPG area, that this reaction okay, can go backward and forward. In the case of sulfur transfaces, it only does sulfation. It doesn't do desulfation. To do desulfation, you have to use a sulfatase. But here, a fumarase enzyme in in vitro system can go back and forth. In any way, we do not know that the reactions can go back and forth because as multiple reactions is happening in parallel, simultaneous, the presence of past or sulfur transfers, it is likely that in very well, this reaction is irreversible, but in, in vitro, it is reversible because we can add a single enzyme without any other sulfation, look for the activity. And recently, I think last week, Jian Lu, our competitor, published a paper that has shown that this enzyme is irreversible too. And in the in vitro system, some sites they are irreversibly modified, and some sites they can do reversible modifications. And they use again the hydrogen deuterium exchange techniques to show that some sites are reversible and some sites are reversible. But again, this tells you how critical this deuterium, okay, hydrogen deuterium exchange as opposed to using hydrogen tritium information. So now we have a hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry that we can use to understand more about the kinetics and about how the enzymes can act upon. And also we can locate the action of the enzymes within the poly polysaccharides or oligosaccharides and the fragmentation so forth. So now it expands our ability to understand more about the action of enzymes by switching from tritium to deuterium. And uh, so we're very pleased with that. And so we're able to understand more about the action of enzymes. And this slide basically shows that when you treat with the enzyme at zero level, this is what you get, 339. At 12 hours, you can see more deuterium incorporation. And if you for 48 hours, you get more deuterium incorporation. But it doesn't tell you how much of this glucuronic acid, because more and more deuterium incorporation doesn't necessarily mean that you have more iodonic acid. The reaction also is reversible, can go back and forth. So when you take this molecule and then you can um, do uh, kinetic acid, you can see that uh, you have glucuronic acid, iodonic acid. At 12 hours, you have equal heights of non deuterated and deuterated. You still have the peak height is like this. And after 48 hours, and you are more deuterated, but still the peak ratio is pretty much the same. This tells you that this reaction is always in favor of glucuronic acid. And so even though the reaction is, okay, can convert the enzyme, can convert the glucose to iodo, but the reaction is reversible, 
that is reversible enough that it favors a reverse reaction more than the forward reaction. Therefore, it doesn't matter how long it can incubate and the reaction is in favor of glucose and iodine, even though it has more deuterium incorporated. So, the deuterium incorporated as a glucuronic acid, here is uh, hydrogen, glucuronic acid is a deuterium incorporated hydronic acid. So, it basically is a reverse reaction, but with the deuterium in it. And so that's why we found it. The reaction is always in favor of uh, uh, glucuronic acid. Of course, once you couple this reaction to OST enzyme, sulfur transferases, maybe you can prevent the reverse reaction. For example, 2 OST can be used. By using 2 OST enzyme and the PAVS concentration, we can selectively and hopefully, not hopefully and selectively, we can sulfate hydrogonic acid uh, to greater extent than glucuronic acid, and therefore we can processively convert the glucose into iodine, and that may perhaps explain how in heparin or more hydrogonic acid, maybe the mechanism of action is different for heparin and heparin. First of all, in heparin, you have domains. In heparin, you have domains. So, that's another factor that can also control why in heparin, you have more hydronic acid. But now, this is a great technique one can use to understand more about action of enzymes and also to confirm uh, affirm that you actually have a glucuronic acid and hydronic acid in the whole sac that they generate using enzymes. So, another one, uh, it has been believed for a long time in the field that 3-OST exists in multiple isoforms. Each one like, can only make a specific structure and there is no overlap. So maybe each enzyme can make one or two structures. So in collaboration with uh, Dr. Burns in uh, Georgia, where Saraja came from, to my lab. And so we got these six different structures, and Pav has carried out these reactions, uh, and where she found that this structures, this is the target site, which is separated by glucose, 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 iodo, 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 glucose, glucose, iodo, two years, and glucose, iodo, iodo, glucose. So we want to look at the effect of if you were <coughs> The effect of epimer configuration and the action of 3 OST1 enzyme. And uh, so we expect to see only one, only one, maybe two will work on it. But we found that as many as five will use one, two, three, five, and six worked on this. Okay, one, two, three, five, six. So one, two, three, five, and six can undergo modifications. And with the exception of uh, four, so they can have iodo and glucose. So when you have a glucose on the reducing side of this target site, uh, this does not undergo modification. When you have a glucose on the reducing side, it didn't undergo modifications at all. And so then we want to compare this enzyme because this enzyme is well known and well characterized in back in Bob Rosenberg's lab where I came from. So we want to compare this enzyme to the dark 3 os 3 because our focus was 3 os 3 which is not still well characterized by a lot of questions and concerns about 3 os 3 action. But 3 os 2 one we know a lot more about 3 os 2 one enzyme. So, so we started with 3 os 2 one to understand more about the, uh, the things was happening. But we are surprised, which itself is very surprised to me. And then we compare it against unknown, not well characterized in 3 os 3 And the 3 os 3 enzyme, the same substrate was used as used in 3 os 2 one in 3 os 3 We found only structures 2, 3, and 6 can undergo modification. 2, 3, and 6 can undergo modifications. And it is expected that this cannot be modification site for 3OC3, which has been reported in the past and which is consistent with what we found. So the 2 o sulfation of the hydrogenic acid restricts the action of 3OC1 and 2 to a 3 a different side. So when you have 2 o sulfation here, and you can do 3OC3 modification here, but not here. So when you have a 2 o sulfation here, 3 o one can act on this side, but not on this side. So when you have a 2 o sulfation, 3 OST1 can work here, but not here. When you have a 3 OST3 enzyme, and it doesn't work here, it works here. So that much is known from back from Bob Rosenberg's lab. So we try to understand more about this, and this is what we found. So based on that, we propose that 3 OST isoforms, even though it seems to be proposed before, they have a rigorous specificity, and they can only do specific modifications. And what we found, that 3 OST1 is, okay, can make as many as five different Modifications can carry out four different modifications, and 3 os 2 can make three different structures. Based on that, we found that 3 os 2 one and 3 can make specific structures that have overlapping actions. So, they are promiscuous actions by themselves, and also they have overlapping actions between 3 os 2 one and 3 os 2 three So, this may explain why the mix rack back in uh, the time was in Harvard, I mean, he moved uh, to uh, Duke, not Duke, Dartmouth Medical School. And when he did the knockout experiment with the 3 os mice, at that time, Bob Rosenberg's lab has shown the 3 os one is critical to generate anticoagulant structures. In order to confirm the heparin anticoagulant activity, you need 3 sulfation. The 3 sulfation has to come from 3 os one If you do 3 os 3 modification, you have no anticoagulant activity. 
and 3OST1 modification is required to have anticoagulant activity. And uh, so then you have done the 3OST1 knockout experiments, hoping that you will see a massive coagulation on the mice dying. But what happened that mice survived, no problem, except it suffered from intrauterine growth. So the mice were much smaller than expected. 3OST1, it's a rare modification, but uh, expected phenotype is a coagulation, massive, okay? Uh, coagulation and then clotting and then mice supposed to die, but mouse survived uh, postnatal. But the only thing that is a small mouse, it can much smaller than expected size intra, intra, uh, is what they call uh, is uh, intra uh, growth problems much smaller. And uh, so that may explain one thing: the 3OS21 makes more than one structure besides the anticoagulant structure, can make a non-anticoagulant structure, and that may regulate uh, the embryogenesis and growth and so forth. And also, this tells us that some other isoforms, not necessarily 3 os 3 but 3 os 5 3 os 6 can generate structures, and that can compensate the action of 3 os one and Therefore, sometimes with knockout experiments, you may not be able to get very accurately the exact uh, outcome and role and, uh, of each of the isoforms. And that's a downside of knockout experiments. So then you can go with in vitro systems, make structures, look out for the binding partners, and then try to understand more about how each different structures can interact with the structures made by different isoforms or the enzymes. So then we also look at okay, uh, how the 2 sulfation can affect the action of 6 ost enzymes. And uh, it has been shown that 6 ost have no specificity. All 6 ost can make the same structures pretty much. And we found recently that this is not necessarily true. Both Karthik and uh, Tau found that the 6 ost forms actually have a very unique specificity. And uh, they're influenced by uh, the adjacent sulfate groups and the 2 sulfate groups and so forth. And so we found that 6 ost this is a control. This is how disaccharide pressure looks like when you treat with the enzyme, uh, hyperlysis. The 6 ost one enzyme, we got this peak is increased dramatically, and then the 6 ost 2 is somewhat similar to the control, 6 ost 3 is between 6 ost one and 2, so we know 6 ost one has a higher activity which converts this, this group into MS6s, whereas okay, the 6 ost 2 and 3 have less propensity to convert this peak, the 6 ost one has a higher propensity to convert this into the 6 sulfation. So we know that 6 ost have several differences in isoforms, what kind of structures they can make, which is again a new knowledge that we generated, so this is all then, um, uh, argues against conventional wisdom, what is known in the field. So the other one, okay, people, okay, the, even though that was not the focus on which I'm going to talk about two different things. So NDST is required for CFA fumarase action, and the CFA fumarase is required for 2 OST action. So that means that we can add all three enzymes. Each one is not interfering with other enzyme action, and therefore you should be able to get the biologically active site. So uh, then you take the... Uh, uh, heparan sulfate, a white type heparan sulfate, and then you do FGF1 receptor complex formation uh, with uh, this is not a wild type, this is a heparan sulfate synthesized by using these enzymes concurrently. What I meant that you add all three enzymes together concurrently, and uh, so we don't see any binding with FGF1 and receptors, and FGF1 and receptor 2. But when you add these enzymes, NDST and CFA fumarase and 2OST, one by one by one, and we saw a complex formation with FGF1 and receptor and FGF1 receptor 2. And there's a control hepatron sulfate from wild type cells which also can form the complex. And uh, so this says two things. One is that when you add the enzymes together, which is not interfering with each other, and expected to generate the binding side. It didn't generate the binding side. But when you add the same enzymes, one by one by one, we are able to generate the binding side. That means that sequentially you generate one structure, when you add the enzymes concurrently, you make different kind of structures. And uh, as a result of that, when you do sequential modification, we are able to generate a structure that can form the complex. But it also says something which we have been focused in this paper, which is that it has been shown that MGF, MGF receptor complex formation requires a 6 sulfation right now. And here, it forms a complex even without 6 sulfation. So it also tells one thing, whether it can still form the complex without 6 sulfation, or, okay, uh, that's, that's what we've shown here, but what, how relevant this is to biological context is a different story. So this also tells something. So what is known in the literature that we have proven that is not true, that without such sulfation can form the complex. Second thing is that it also tells something. Binding doesn't necessarily mean that biologically significant. So we need to determine whether this complex formation is as good as this complex, which looks similar to me in the band, for complex formation. This is from the wild type HS. It's possible that this complex 
is different from this complex in the inner system where one can trigger the signaling and one cannot trigger the signaling. And so that's where we stand. And so this slide basically tells that about uh, uh, when you do concurrent modification, you get the structure which is different from uh, getting the structure when you use these enzymes in sequential manner. Therefore, this can form the complex, this fails to form the complex. So based on all this study that we've done the last three, four years through, uh, primarily with you know, students like Tao and Karthik and uh, Xylophone started this as a postdoc back when he left the lab. And so we can come to the conclusion that when you take an ascent chain, you make the structures, uh, modifications, and uh, so you can add these enzymes in sequential manner or uh, in a way that uh, they are not coordinated with each other and makes the structures which are different from when you add these enzymes together with structures. So the fact that this, we have enormous diversity possible exist in nature because there are so many functions that just play a role okay, in many different systems. So based on that, we believe that by having these two mechanisms operating in parallel in nature, enzymes can work in parallel, they can also work in sequentially, so that the structures that can be made only by sequential mechanism, or structures that can only be made when they work concurrently, together can make more diverse structure. Otherwise, you only get one set of structures when you do in this pathway or this pathway. By combining both pathways, you end up in having more combinatorial structures, and therefore, they can exercise more functions. And uh, so that's the model that we begin to believe now increasing in the lab. Of course, this has to be again proven and demonstrated by looking for the complex formation, and that perhaps maybe yep, we will do that by looking at the confocal microscope with enzyme localization and so forth. And so next one I would like to briefly touch based on that, and xylocytes, and I said the xylocylation is a very fast event that triggers the GAG formation. We can also trigger the GAG formation without a core protein. If we take a xylose, stick it with the hydrophobic group, and so we made a number of xylocytes in the lab by using click chemistry, and uh, it was done mostly by we in the lab with uh, uh, the past postdoc money, uh, and so the number of xylocytes was made, and then we are shown that the xylocytes can get into the Golgi from outside and they can start making seeds. So this is a small molecule, maybe 250, 300 Daltons. So they can make as high as 40,000 Daltons. It's a small molecule, you feed them to cells and they can make as big as uh, the GAG chance of 40,000 Daltons. It's a phenomenal. It has been used by many other people in the field, okay, like more than 40 years, and demonstrating that xylocytes with the hydrophobic group can pump GAG chains and that we have extended that study beyond what has been shown in the past by using click chemistry because click chemistry generates structures which is metabolically more stable. Some of the structures that we made shown here. And what we found that these different xylocytes make different structures and also they have different priming activity. And some xylocytes with increasing concentration, they make more GAG chains. Some xylocytes with increasing concentration, they make less GAG chains. So it is not a diffusion that controls uh, how much GAG is being primed, and also other factors could control that we don't understand fully yet. And what is surprising to us, when we did the DNA analysis, uh, this, this xylophone did this, and we found that some xylocytes make the GAG chains which are very broad, and some xylocytes okay, make the GAG chains which are very, very narrow. And this tells you again, this is an anion exchange chromatography. It tells you sulfation density. It also tells you what kind of sulfation pattern you have. If it's more heterogeneous, you get a broad peak. If it's more homogeneous sulfation pattern, you get more narrow peak. And uh, so based on that, and fact that xylocytes, different xylocytes make molecular weights, uh, different GAG chains to different molecular weights, it goes from as small as 8,000 Daltons into as high as 35,000 Daltons or 38,000 Daltons, which now start resembling close to what is being made in nature. But most of xylocytes, which are commercially available, makes much shorter chains, like 3,000 Daltons, 4,000 Daltons. And we have never seen a xylocyte that can make as big as 38,000 Daltons. But the first time it was shown with the click xylocytes, we can make GAG chains as high as 38,000 Daltons, which is very close to what has been otherwise made by using core protein to which you add the GAG chains. So based on all these factors, the different xylocytes make different GAG chains, different sulfation pattern, different molecular weight, and different priming activity. And uh, 
So the, all of these things put together, we can't explain by any mechanism other than a gyrosum concept in which your blue xylocytes go to the blue compartment, they make a different gag chains, the black one goes and make different, all different chains, the red one goes and makes specific chains, the black one goes everywhere and make different chains. Now this is the model currently we're working with, and this gyrosomes, what we mean is that is an enzyme complex where different enzymes reside together, or they're in a close proximity in a way that they can control other actions, as supposed to be the distance apart, and where they can't control the action of each other, they can only control through a substrate. But if they're together, the physical proximity, or they're separated by a regulatory factor, and they can now, in addition to the substrate regulating the action of the enzymes, they themselves can regulate the action of each other enzymes, and therefore they can make structures which are, would otherwise be different when they're made without communicating each other. And so that's a model that we're going, moving forward with that. And so one of the applications that we have come up recently is that these xylocytes as in terms of gag chains can also be used to inhibit gag chains. So until now, people have to use genetic knockout experiments, okay, it means you have to knock out the enzymes involved in the gag chain formations, and but those things, knockout experiments are irreversible, and also oftentimes is lethal. You can talk to the biologists, okay, in the lab, in the, in the audience here, they'll tell you, that the knockout experiments are irreversible and often lethal embryogenesis, especially the one that deals with the product like ants. So chemical approaches, which are irreversible, which are attractive, but the, it doesn't exist except the chlorate and BFA. So chlorate is a bleaching agent, and BFA is brofeldine, which is a fungal metabolite, which basically disrupts the Golgi. The so Golgi is a very complex organelle. It's a very dynamic organelle. It keeps changing its shape and size, and cis becomes a medial, medial becomes trans, trans becomes a pre-Golgi, then pre-Golgi becomes a medial, like it's like it's a, keeps moving around as a vesicle, so okay, back and forth. So to go back and forth, there's mechanisms that involve a lot of different proteins involved that we don't still understand, and how this happens. But BFA, what it does, it blocks the assembly of medial and trans Golgi completely. So it prevents the conversion of cis Golgi to trans Golgi, and thereby, it, it basically bombing the Golgi, okay? It's like bombing the Afghanistans to get the uh, Bin Laden out. Luckily, we didn't do that way. We just got him physically out like that. The BFA is like basically bombing uh, like the Golgi completely out to block the functions. Because Golgi does ends, okay, a lot of different things. It does end like oscillation. It does work like oscillations. And it does glycan and glycan productions. It makes a glycan lipids. It makes a number of things happening in the Golgi. And plus post functional modifications. So if you remove Golgi, what happens? So you don't, you will understand the function of protoglycans. So we want to develop a specific technique and uh, so, which is a chemical technique which is reversible and selectively blocks only gag chains. So this was done in collaboration with Koketsu Group and my student, we did this with Dinesh, who uh, was a visiting student from Japan. And that they found that they can, instead of xylocyte, with the hydroxyl groups, you replace the hydroxyl with the fluorine and instead of priming gag chains, now they'll be competing with the enzymes, the lactose transferase, where the lactose is added and they start priming gag chains. Then we have fluorine here, which prevents the transfer of lactose from lactose UDP to uh, this residue by lactose transferase, and it doesn't form gag chains. So by using these molecules, we've shown that we can actually inhibit glycosyl glycan biosynthesis selectively without affecting glycolipid biosynthesis and without affecting N glycans and O glycans. Then also, uh, Karthik in the lab have used this molecule to show that uh, heparin sulfate is required for angiolysis, which I said in the very beginning of the day. Heparin sulfate is required for angiolysis. So if you block the heparin sulfate biosynthesis by using this molecule in endothelial cells, what happens? Then you, you will not form the tubes. So yes, a nice elegant assay in the lab by blocking selectively its biosynthetic pathway by using the fluorozalocytes, and you have shown that it prevents uh, angiogenesis. We are also looking out for the molecules, something similar, which can stimulate angiogenesis. So eventually we would like to use this knowledge to facilitate uh, the transplantation of pig organs into humans where angiogenesis is required and where the inflammation has to be regulated, where the coagulation has to be regulated. Therefore, we would like to use the enzymes to make anticoagulant structures, using the enzymes to make the structures that can regulate chemical interactions, They're using the structures that can modulate the biosynthetic pathways to make molecules that can be more pro-angiogenic. Therefore, we can facilitate uh, the transplantation of the pig organs into humans, and that's the ultimate goal behind 
uh, this project uh, in which we need to also have a training component in which we have to do a lot of teaching involved, educating you all, so that more you understand about the excess biostatic pathways, catabolic pathways, what kind of stretches they can make, and if you knock out, you stimulate what happens to the systems that's at cell level, at organ level, and developmental biology so that you can start using this knowledge that you gain towards facilitating what we're supposed to do as a team in the um, uh, pro program project, okay? And I think I'd like to stop here, and then we need to now move to the new topic. So we finished talking about structures and functions of the protein like and, and understanding about biostatic pathways, catabolic pathways, modulating, and affecting these causes consequences. So now we're going to move on to the third topic. It's supposed to be one and a half hours. We only have half an hour left, and talking about how we can analyze the gag chains. So before I move on, do you have any questions here at all? I know so much information. Okay, so let's move now into the next topic. No, it's the same. Okay, now we all know any NS domain exists for hepatic sulfate. And this molecule is very complex, highly heterogeneous, and difficult to characterize the structures as it stands by using NMR. And NMR is very amenable for small molecules, starter's molecule like maybe 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 dollars. And this gets bigger and bigger. I know that Krishna's group uses proteins, okay, and using the same techniques for the gag analysis and trying to figure out the sequencing is really impossible. It's very hard because and they all have almost similar chemical shifts in the very close fraction between 3 ppm to 4 ppm. Unlike protein, they can have a chemical shifts like a wide range, of course, within the limitations. But here you have much less it's a problem. So then what you have, and also you have small amount of gag chains produced, not substantial amount of gag produced from cells. I said you know, from 1 million cells, you can probably get 5 microgram, 10 microgram, not much is left. So then you have to work how you analyze the structures and also you cannot analyze the gag chains and the intact chains to look for the sequence and structures and compositions. So what people typically do that in a lab and in any labs, they isolate cells, from, they isolate gag chains from cells and then they throw them into the HPLC. As weak, as a BAE is a weak anion exchange column. Okay? They, they don't bind tightly but they do bind as so a weak anion column. And there, we can look at the intact gag chains without cleaning them, without cleaning them. We can look at the populations. So we always see the heparan sulfate comes first and the chondritin sulfate comes next. And the reason is that heparan sulfate has MA domains, NS domains, so they are non-sulfated and sulfated regions, and therefore they often have a less charge density. Whereas chondritin sulfate, they have more homogeneous sulfation, they have at least one or two sulfate per chain, and they're often more sulfated, they're longer in chain length, all these things together, they often come much later. And not very, very later, but comes later than heparan sulfate. So they use two peaks, one is HS, one is DS, at least in endothelial cells, that is true. This is also true in CHO cells, this is also true in a couple of other cell lines, I don't quite recall now, and this is true about, uh, we don't know if it's true in all these cell types. So now what you do next, so you know that you see these peaks, and you know this is a gag, it's a weak anion column. So then you want to find out which is HS and which is CS. If you don't have any clear knowledge, what you do that, you take the gag chains from cells, you put them weak anion column, and you find out what they are, how many peaks you have, and then you treat with the enzymes, heparin lyases, which specifically includes heparin sulfate, and chondritis EBC enzyme, which specifically includes chondritis sulfate. A dimetan sulfate. So this is a wild type uh, gag produced from the cells without any enzyme treatment. And then we treat with the HEP123, we saw this peak disappear completely, and they all become disaccharides. The disaccharides will be migrating much earlier than this peak is gone, and this peak is preserved because HEP123 cannot act upon chondritis sulfate, dimetan sulfate like structures. So next we took the same molecules here and treat with chondritis ABC enzyme which, if this is a chondritis sulfate, this only can disappear and this will not disappear. So we took this molecule profile, treat with chondritis ABC, and they come here, see this peak is disappeared now, and now they all become disaccharides, whereas this peak is still preserved here. So that's how you'll find out 
whether they have a gag chains, if they have gag chains, what kind of gags they have, HS or series, and how much of HS they made, how much of series is made. And this is how you will figure out uh, for filing black cells black hands from cell based things. Did you say what the three peaks are and meaning the first three peaks? So, what are the first three peaks? The, this peak? And what's the difference between the first three there? You were talking about this one? In B? So, the question is what are the difference between these three peaks that you see in B? So, this one is treated with the HEP123 enzyme, which specifically cleaves heparan sulfate. And uh, so, when we cleave down this intact polymer, Okay, now it's broken down to disaccharides and maybe tetrasaccharides, and then they're migrating here. And we do not know what these species are, and uh, because we are not used to standards, all we can tell that they're all broken down into disaccharides and tetrasaccharides, and that's why they start migrating earlier. But they are fragments of heparan sulfate, disaccharides and tetrasaccharides, and we do not know exact species of each of the peak. Because the weak anion column. The goal is to find out whether they make gag, they make gag, they have HS or CS. That's what we want to find out. And which peak belongs to HS and which peak belongs to CS. That's the goal, objective here. And therefore, we don't invest our time to figure out what they are. But we'll find out what those peaks are. Because all these peaks represent disaccharides and tetrasaccharides. Coming out from the addition of this peak with the HEP123 enzyme. So we want to find out what those peaks are in the next step. That's what we do here. The first we'll do weak anion column to understand the gag composition, HS they make, CS they make, and they make gag or not at all. And then we go and ask specific questions about what those peaks are by going to in-depth analysis by using standards and with unknown samples and by using strong anion exchange column. It's not a weak column. It's a strong anion exchange column. It binds very tightly. Because the reason why we don't want to use strong anion column here is it's a big polymer. If you use a strong anion column, it's going to bind so tightly and this is not going to come out, the big chain, and it's going to come out eventually. You're going to force them to come out no matter how big they are. Use a high salt. But what happens? This heparan sulfate and chondrodine sulfate won't get dissolved very well because we also want to understand how much of HS is made, how much of CS is made. We want to dissolve them. That's why we use a weak anion column to make both HS and CS bind and also get dissolved. But once it's a strong column, they're going to bind so tightly that it's difficult to dissolve them at all. And that's the reason why we first do weak anion column. Then we switch to strong anion column where now they are already fragmented into disaccharides. They bind very tight. Uh, disaccharides. If you use a BAE column, they bind very weakly. We don't know what they are. They can come together. And you only see three peaks here. Right? And if you go to strong anion column, you can see like 8, 10, 12, 14 peaks. Because all these disaccharides and tetrasaccharides bind very tightly to a strong anion column. Then we use a very slow gradient. Start from zero all the way, go to 100%. And they maintain a very high salt for a long time and then bring them back to zero molar sodium chloride. So we do longer time and also with the high salt and also the strong onion column where the disaccharides are much smaller, they don't bind tightly in the weak onion column. By switching to strong column, we can make them bind more tightly. Then therefore, we can dissolve them nicer and then we can figure out what are the uh, molecules they are, what kind of composition they have, what are the peaks they are. By using standards co-injected with uh, unknown molecules, unknown disaccharide composition derived from cells. So, this is a chondrodine sulfate disaccharide profile for this peak. This is the peak that you take, you have multiple peaks coming out, then you take the chondrodine sulfate, and then you mix with the standards, disaccharides, and then you use, we use slightly different column. We recently found that the column called YMC, which is better than strong on anything column, where we can resolve the chondrodine sulfate disaccharide very nicely, based on 6 or sulfated, 4 or sulfated. I don't know whether we can separate 2 sulfated or not, maybe they're still working on it. And then 2 is 6 is, 4 is 6 is, 2 is 4 is 6 is. So we can nicely separate all possible disaccharides based on sulfation pattern, based on sulfation density, based on number of uh, disulfate, uh, uh, number of sulfate groups. And then we use slightly different column so we can get the composition of the chondrodine sulfate disaccharide level and HS disaccharide level by using strong anion column. And no, the, the, so the question is whether we cannot differentiate, and I think we don't have a standard for the 2S currently in the lab, 
And that's why I believe that US can be separable on this one. And we need to adjust the gradient maybe. And right now I think they are not tested to us because we don't have a standard. Is right? So yeah. It's, it's, it could be overlapping with one of those. It could be overlapping or we could separate them as well. We don't know because we don't have a standards to. And so we, what I've shown here is the standards, okay? And see how they resolve it. And then we put the unknown sample and we can look at each peak that we can figure out. And we don't have currently your two self standard available. So once we, we do not know where they're migrating, once we know that, then we can take any unknown sample of chondritis sulfate, then we can tell exact composition because these things really work very well. And we had always had problems with chondritis sulfate. Hepatitis sulfate were fine always. The last six months or one year, okay, we focused on chondritis sulfate as well to understand more about CS disaccharide structures and found that uh, this column, William C. by Vimal, works really well. And then we jumped on this one because it was working on action guidance project where he has to look at the sulfation pattern, how it affects the action guidance. And the existing carbon pack column, which is fantastic for heparan sulfate. When you switch it to chondritis sulfate, you lose a strong iron column, it really fails, it doesn't resolve very well. We resolve some disaccharides, but not all disaccharides. Then he found that the OMC columns are good, and then I asked him to go and buy it, and he did it, and then he found that, wow, this is good, because we can go and buy another one. I asked him how much it costs, it's thousand dollars to go and spend it, okay? And then come back and ask me again, so he has to use it, he has to lock it, the column. And uh, so, so he is very happy now that he can use this disaccharide profile from the OMC column to look at for how the astrocyte derived chondritis sulfate affects the action guidance and so forth. That's his focus. So, now coming back, so I've shown you all the chromatograph profile, what you do. And then, now we have the GAG chain, in this case HS chain, I see it from the cell, what you do? Go NMR? No, well, okay, you can't go. Because you get from cells, one few micrograms, you cannot go to NMR. So we're going to talk about NMR later on, Sarah John. And uh, so, and also it's very complex structures. What you do, that, we can do heparin layers treatment first, as I shown in the previous uh, HLS chromogram slides. Treat this polymer with the heparin layers or chondrinous ABC to get them into disaccharides and tetrasaccharides, and then mix with over standards, then you should be able to find the composition. It doesn't tell you the sequence. It doesn't tell you NA regions, how big the size is. It doesn't tell you NS, how big the size is. There is a question, how big the NA is, how big the NS is going to be. If you compare two different cells, two different organisms, two different heart during development, you want to know how much of NA region, how much NS region is that. What you do, you do nitrous acid treatment. So you do low pH nitrous acid treatment, it cleans the NS region. You do the high pH nitrous acid treatment, it cleans the NA region. So by using high pH nitrous acid and low pH nitrous acid, you should be able to distinguish NS and NA region and they get fragmented disaccharides and oligosaccharides. And then this is how people analyze the treat with, take the unknown polymer HS, the treat with nitrous acid, low pH or high pH. And then they will give the disaccharide, okay, disaccharide, cetra, hexa, acta, deca, tol, and 14 mer, and they separate them on the P10 column, size exclusion column. I think I said you guys use G25. I don't know what you used, and you can use another column called G25, G50, G100, and likewise there's another, this is also paradox based, another one is called polyagulimate based columns called P columns, P2, P4, P6, P8, P10, and so then you treat the big polymer with nitrous acid, and then load them onto this gigantic tall column, 6 feet, 8 feet, 9 feet, 10 feet, so you can have better separations, and then you can see nice resolutions here. And so then you can understand NS disaccharide regions and NA disaccharide regions and how much NS is there. So you do both low pH and high pH. You cannot only do low pH to figure out NA regions. You have to do both low pH and high pH. Then you can put the map together. Then you can understand. Well, this is still telling you the sequence. Because you only fragmented molecule to understand the NS and NA length and so forth. And if you want the sequence, which is present within this each oligosaccharide, then you have to go to NMR or mass pack. And we often go with the mass pack very fast because you need only maybe 10 microgram, 5 microgram, maybe 1 microgram. That's all you can get from million cells. So therefore the mass pack is very amenable when there's such a small amount of gag chains. And so the problem is that often you have a lot of problems with the mass pack. It can undergo desulfation, the mass pack, the oligos can undergo fragmentations and also that larger and larger oligos you go and you have less and less oligos because happen like I says and nitrous acid tend to cleave them into disaccharides more than the oligos. So you have a less oligos available and they have a fragmentation issues of desulfation. How are you going to find out? On top of that, you have a heterogeneity, you can only fraction based on size, size, 
they're not based on charges when you go for larger and larger structures. Dye and tetra and hexa probably are lucky enough that you can separate them into nice pieces. But once you start going for even hexa, it becomes impossible. You have million possible, like thousands of different possible structures. So you have the heterogeneities involved, and there are alkali metal ion addictions with a lot of sodium, calcium, magnesium, and all those things can cause problems. People historically use a fab, but this large amount, and in order to fragmentation, you cannot go for higher oligos. Mold is really very good mass spectrometer, you can use it. And uh, the problem is that negatively charged molecule cannot fly in moldy and you have to complex with the positively charged peptide or some kind of polyamines. Then these polypeptides are high molecular weight and then you mix them with uh, unknown oligosaccharide. Then they fly beautifully but you don't know the exact molecular weight of that. And then you have to subtract the polypeptide to get the exact molecular weight. Often that moldy is good to make them fly sensitive but it's very bad to get in terms of resolutions, in terms of exact molecular weight, because it's complex with the polypeptide, you cannot get the accurate molecular weight. That's a downside. That's an unfortunate downside. And also, MALDI is not very amenable for the LCMS. And where is the ESI is amenable for the LCMS. You can couple to the liquid chromatography where you can fractionate the molecules, heterogeneous mo molecules into small disaccharides, tetrahexa, as many as you can, and then you can directly couple them to ESI which is very amenable, that's why people now increasing the last 5-10 years switching to ESI which is amenable for the LC techniques and there are many different techniques that are available and also the metal ion adductions can be overcome by using uh, what I call DBA, diabetal ammonium acetate can be used to remove the sodium and uh, magnesium and calcium binding to the sulfate groups now DBA will overtake and also having the diabetal amine which is a hydrophobic group forms a complex with the heparin, makes them fly better and therefore you can see that in the absence of diabetal amine, this is how the pentasaccharide which is commercially used right now as anticoagulant looks like. But once you add the DBA, now it gets resolved into these pieces and also like a doubly charged, uh, this is like five charges, this is a double, like, this is triple, triple charges and double charges. So now we can resolve them into less charged pieces and we can reduce the molecular weight, you can do fragmentations, you can get the sequencing information and so forth. And you can also use isotope enriched molecules. You can do the quantitation of the disaccharides by mixing the unknown sample with the known disaccharide with isotope enriched. So we can figure out the composition of each disaccharide by using mass spec. When the mass spec is not quantitative, but you can make it quantitative by adding the isotope enriched molecules. So are you going to be touching on the top down empty mass spec which they use for the sequences? So the question is that I'm going to touch down on talking about uh, the. FTMS mass spec, right? No, I'm not going to talk because we have a very limited time and also I don't know. Uh, people have used for, okay, for the, mass, the FTMS for sequencing, but still it's very complex and so sophisticated and still may not give the meaningful information. And also we are more inclined towards the philosophy that the sequence is less critical the multiple structures can have the same function. And that's why we are more inclining towards and a lot of evidence coming from the lab to suggest that multiple structures can have the same function. Therefore, it's more critical to understand the positioning of the sulfate groups rather than looking for the sequence. If your sequence may not give you biological insight that you are looking out for. And so, that you are looking out for the positioning of the sulfate groups, then we can go for low resolutions and then we can figure out combination with the heparin lysis digestions and then a semi-fragmentation that we can do with ESI TOF. I think with that, I'll transfer now to Salaja, and she's going to talk about now NMR techniques, and she's also going to talk tomorrow about uh, chemical synthesis. She's a veteran in chemical synthesis of heparin oligosaccharides, and most people I know who have done the heparin chemical synthesis, they retired, but they finished because there's so many steps involved. And she's still postdoc, and just joined my lab a year ago, and because she has developed a very nice uh, chemical synthetic approach. So she's going to focus today on NMR, tomorrow on uh, the chemical synthesis approaches. Go ahead, Salaja. That's all we have time, Sanaja. <laughs> I think you need to use this. Yeah. They want you to be at the recording. Oh, I see. I'm just going to stand here, so I'll just set it here. Okay. So, um, okay, maybe I'll just stand here. Um, so, Dr. Kubi talked to you about um, mass spectrometric techniques. There are 
mass spectrometry has its own advantages in terms of you know you need very small amount of sample and um, you can get information rather quickly but nmr can actually help you in cases where mass spectrometry may not be that informative for example uh, when you take glucuronic acid and ioduronic acid the only difference is the c5 position you know in the case of glucuronic acid the c5 is up ioduronic acid the c5 is down and when you take those uh, a glucuronic acid containing disaccharide or an iodo containing disaccharide you put them in the lcms they are actually going to have the same retention time and the same molecular weight so how do you distinguish if you have a glucose or iodo that's when uh, nmr is really handy i'll show you how the glucuronic acid has a, has a completely different nmr chemical shift and iodo is a completely different nmr chemical shift and uh, in terms of um, where the sulfates are located again if you in the mass spec a two uh, a disulfated molecule will give the same uh, i mean a disulfated molecule depending on where the sulfates are are going to, is going to give you the same information for example if you have a disulfate containing a two sulfate on the hydronic acid and a six sulfate on the glucosamine you are going to get the same information versus a disulfate having a three o sulfate and a six o sulfate well you can resolve them in the hplc with different retention times but when mass spec doesn't give you information enough information this is where um, nmr comes comes in handy and um, it's a non destructive method so you you isolate like 10 mg of gags you can take all the 10 mg get a very good mass spectral um, nmr spectrum and then when you're done you just freeze the sample it's intact you can go on and do some other things you want to do with it and uh, so these days the sensitivity of nmr is highly improved you can have um, there are high field nmrs 800 or 600 or 500 that most institutions have these days and we have a cryo probe where it is a cold probe and it's highly sensitive and these cryo probes can take 3 mm tubes okay the typical nmr tube would be a 5 mm tube these are 3 mm tubes you can use a more concentrated sample it takes like 150 microliters you can have a very concentrated sample and you can get very good information in, in a short time relatively short time so before i go on i have to um give a recap of how we number all these um, sugars because you're going to be going through that all the time so over here we have the n acetyl glucosamine okay so this is c1 c2 is always the one with the amine group c3 is here it could be sulfated or free and this is c5 which has no um, hydroxyls attached to it okay and it is attached to the ch2 group okay and uh, this is a c6 position it could be sulfated or free when you take the uronic acid if i make i will show this funky um, chair then it's an hydronic acid this is what glucuronic acid looks like and uh, always almost all the times the glucuronic acid c2 is free okay and the three position could be sulfated or free and the c5 unlike the glucosamine doesn't have a ch2 it is replaced by a carboxyl group so i just want you to be familiar with the numbering okay so this is a synthetic heparin uh, hexasaccharide that i prepared um so as you can see here what i want you to take home here is each of these groups okay each of these sugars will have a distinct um hydrogen chemical shift for example here the this glucosamine here this h1 has a chemical shift of 5.58 and if we take this glucose i mean here that is distinct from this one it has a different chemical shift okay and then um, this one here is this one here and then so that you can distinguish the three glucose amines so where these hydrogens are going to come depends on the neighboring residue okay so that's what controls where you will see these glucose amines secondly i also want you to take home that this is a glucuronic acid here hydronic acid here so these are going to have completely different chemical shifts for example the h1 of glucuronic acid is typically at 4.5 okay so we have two of those residues so they almost overlap but still you can distinguish them i'll show you in a minute how you can and then you have hydronic acid here the c1 is right here uh that's the h1 of hydronic acid then we also have the h5 of hydronic acid that's at 4.99 so this is how you can distinguish so the this uh, 4.5 to 5.5 is what i call the anomeric region so that is where all the c1s of all the sugars are going to show up 
Okay, it's actually it gives you a very good idea of what kind of sugars that are present in your uh, sample. But when you go to this region, this is where it gets complicated. You see, there's a lot of overlap. This is where all the H2s and H3s are all going to come. Okay, sometimes you can actually distinguish the H2s of the glucosamines that come right around here. So I will tell you what happens if there's a lot of overlap. There are more sophisticated NMRs you can do to resolve these things. So what I showed you here is a synthetic oligosaccharide. Okay, so defined structure. You exactly know what's in your sample. But unfortunately, when you go to uh, uh, heparin sulfate that you isolate from tissues, you no longer get these cute C NMRs. Okay, so you're going to get something like this, which is broad and not so well resolved. Okay, and um, so this is broad because of the uh, microheterogeneity. Okay, you have different chains of different lengths and different sulfation patterns. That's why you see this overlap. But then, fortunately, there's a large body of research done on these. So almost all of the sulfation patterns that you can see in uh, heparin sulfates is all very well characterized. For example, a glucuronic acid should have this chemical shift. So if you, this, if you see this chemical shift here, you know you have a glucuronic acid and adronic acid and so on. Okay. So uh, adronic acid 2 is sulfated has, is slightly downfield. So what I want you to remember here is when I say downfield, you're going left. When you say upfield, you're going to the right. Okay. So when you put a 2 sulfate on hydronic acid, you're actually increasing the negative charge. Okay, so it's going to go more downfield. So that's around 5.21. And as you can see here, a 2 sulfate is completely different from just hydronic acid with no sulfates on it. Similarly, uh, a glucosamine, N-acetyl glucosamine, is also has its own sets of NMR chemical shift. I want you to, um, I want to draw your attention to this one. When you make a 6 sulfate glucosamine. As you can see here, these are not, not free hydroxyl groups anymore. So you're going to shift the chemical shift downfield to this way. So that's how you know when you see a 4.33 or 4.22, you know you have a 6 sulfated glucosamine. And an N sulfated glucosamine, again, different chemical shifts. When you have a glucosamine NS and 6S, again, you see a more downfield shift. And you'll see a shift here also with the H1, H2, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Probably a polysaccharide. These are not polysaccharides. What length? Um, it should be. It should be low molecular weight heparin. No, it's a low molecular weight heparin. I know it's a specific paper I know, and it's a low molecular weight heparin about six thousand dollars. But still, you have a mixture in there. Of course, that is a mixture. Yes, but you can ballpark it. And I'll show you in the next slide how you can unambiguously assign everything. So on top here, we have a heparin sulfate that's derived from the kidney medulla. Over here, it's derived from the cortex of the bovine kidney. So as you can see here, so when you, have, when you don't have the ironic acid H1, you don't see that here. You know the heparin sulfate, uh, uh, this is a more highly sulfated heparin sulfate that you find in the kidney medulla and uh, slightly less sulfated in the kidney, um, in other region of the kidney, namely the cortex. So how can we get more information from something like this? So if you need to unambiguously assign everything, you know. So what you do is we do uh, HSQC. By HSQC, I mean a hetero, um, heteronuclear correlations. So what that means is, we do a two-dimensional NMR. What I showed you until now is looking at in one dimension, where you only look at one nucleus. Okay. So if you want to get more information, you do a 2D NMR, where along one dimension you have the proton spectrum, and on this direction you have the carbon spectrum. Now, using these correlations with the correlate the proton to the carbon, you can get way more information. In, you can assign everything unambiguously. So what I want you to take home from this is. When you have hydronic acid, okay, the anomeric carbon, the C1 carbon is always going to fall within 100 to 105. And glucuronic acid is also going to fall somewhere in this region. That's typically, you know, 104.8 to it's in this region. And all the glucosamines, they're always going to fall in this region, 98 to 100 region. 
So, also, um, one thing you want to remember is in, in a heparin sulfate chain, the glucosamine is always alpha linked, okay. So, the linkage is down. And when you take uh, glucuronic acid or iodinonic acid, the linkage is always beta. So, alpha and beta will also have different chemical shifts. For example, if it's an alpha linkage, all your carbon shifts are going to be between 95 to 100. So, if you see that, you know you have a lot of glucosamine. And when you have a lot of peaks in this region, you know you have uronic acid, okay. So, that's how it goes. And this is again a blow up of the um, anomeric region. What I want you to uh, take home is, this is all chemical shifts of hydronic acids, okay. And all these hydronic acids are flanked by different glucosamine residues. So, depending on what is on the neighboring residue, you are going to have a different chemical shift, okay. So, it also gives you sequence information and also what type of residues are present in your sample. Yeah. So, do you have information, is there information in the literature like how they shift, whether they shift up field or down field based on? Yes. Yes, there are standards. Actually, I have another uh, slide where I, I show what each one means, but I can pass it on to you after the talk. And um, so, all these techniques I showed to you are very nice. You know, you have, um, you can do nicely carbon proton correlations. But then, um, when you look at the C13 abundance, natural abundance of C13 is probably 1.1 percent. So, if you want to run uh, say a 10 milligram sample, you want to run the HSQC of it, you want to run it 24 hours to get any nice data like the ones I showed you. Or you better have 30 or 40 milligrams so you can get it done in, in like half a day. But what do you do when you have very little sample? Suppose you want to, you want, you're curious to see, you know, what type of heparin sulfates this particular tissue makes or this particular cell line makes. So, what you do in those cases, you um, go over, I mean, uh, you can actually make uh, atom specifically labeled or uniformly labeled hep, um, heparin sulfate chains. Over here, uh, Tau in our lab along with V, they um, synthesize these things chemoenzymatically. So, they uh, they took the K5 um, capsular polysaccharide, uh, they, they took the K5 bacteria and they grow it in a medium containing C13 enriched medium. Or if you grow it in both a C13 enriched and N15 enriched medium, you would get C13 and N15 labeled uh, oligosac uh, polysaccharides from the medium. So, what that helps you to do is, so over here on top, we have a simple K5, okay. This is, this doesn't have any labeling. It is not isotope enriched. This is going to take you really uh, about, say, if you have 5 milligrams of sample, you want to run it like one and a half days to get a very good NMR spectrum, carbon. And carbon takes even longer, you want to run it 48 hours to get a spectrum like this. But if you have, go back to the previous slide. If you have something like this, where you have all the anomeric positions labeled, so all that you will see in your carbon NMR is these anomerically labeled carbons. Okay, so it simplifies the spectrum much easier. And you can get a lot of information. If you do this for a heparin sulfate, you'll probably have four. Okay, which means you have four different kind of sugars. And the bottom panel is this one here, where there is every single carbon is labeled in the ring. And that is going to look like this. It's kind of nice. It gives you high sensitivity. But each of this, you're going to have carbon-carbon splitting in the C13 NMR. So, again a blow up of the same thing and uh, so what I showed you typically what you would do is you would do a hydrogen hydrogen NMR but if you have C13 the sensitivity is so much higher you can basically do a carbon carbon co -C. So, what that gives you is um, connectivity information. Suppose you see a cross peak here, you go this way, you draw a line here, you're going to, it's going to connect to C2. So, you know which carbon is with which hydrogen. So, again another example uh, where uh, Linhardt's group, they took, uh, um, they analyzed the, the GAG composition of, in the central nervous system of bovine and porcine uh, sources, I mean of the brain and spinal cord and they were able to nicely quantify um, the amount of GAGs versus the HS versus CS in spinal cord and the brain. So, in the interest of time, I am going to 
skip this and uh, finally uh, a very interesting application of nmr you know in 2008 there was this um, uh, contamination of heparin right so people typically when they undergo uh, dialysis they get heparin therapy so what happened was when, when these people got he uh, um, heparin therapy a lot of them developed severe an anaphylactic response and then there was nation, uh, globally there were about 100 people died from this and they would investigate what was happening with this? So they took the contaminant, they ran the mass spec, they ran the NMR, and um, it didn't give a lot of information. First of all, they, they digested heparin lysis, and they could see, you know, some of it is getting digested, but some of it is not getting digested. So definitely, there is some unnatural uh, additive in the uh, that's a contaminant in the heparin that is not responding to lysis treatment. And typically, uh, any commercial heparin sulfate or heparin you isolate from animal sources is going to have this disaccharide is that is dermatin sulfate okay so that is uh, that has repeats of hydronic acid and gluc and galactosamine so heparin is typically repeats of glucnac and hydronic acid but here we have dermatin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate which is repeats of glucuronic acid and galactosamine okay mind you this is glucosamine galactosamine where you have the c4 up c4 up So they took the contaminated sample, they ran the NMR, there is some new peaks here. First they thought it might be dermatin sulphate, but they took the NMR of the dermatin sulphate, okay, okay, this is a peak that they saw in the contaminant, but it's not there here, because dermatin sulphate typically gives a peak at 2.08, and that is usually found as a contaminant, in, I mean that is usually found in the apparent sulphate, that does not give the anaphylactic response. So they were scratching and scratching and then they found a lot of aberrant peaks in the, in the contaminated sample. And the HSQC, when they overlay the spectrum of just uh, heparin sulfate or heparin with the, with the contaminated sample, they could see a lot of new peaks. And as you can see here in the anomeric region, there is a new peak here. So, what did they finally conclude from here? I have a, okay, uh, this is a different version, but w what I want you to take home is, they, they, they finally they could see that it is an over-sulfated chondroitin sulfate. Okay, it has more sulfates than a regular chondroitin sulfate and it's not dermatin sulfate. And NMR could actually, so what they did was, they suspected it's going to be the over-sulfated over chondroitin sulfate. They synthesized it chemically in the lab, they ran the NMR of that. And then they, then they ran the NMR of a contaminated sample and they could overlay that, it was it was matching and then they could say, okay, this is a tetra, each uh, disaccharide has four sulfated units and that's what is causing all this anaphylactic response. So to conclude my talk, hopefully I have convinced you that um, NMR is a very powerful technique, it can give you sequence information, it can give you um, information about where the sulfates are present on the chain. And, uh, you know, if you can use it with uh, other techniques like capillary electrophoresis or uh, LCMS, it can give a lot of structural information. And that one shortcoming is you need 2 to 5 milligram sample, but most of this is now um, alleviated by using all the cryoprobes and high field NMRs. And uh, so that's all I have for you. Yes, you can do NOC too. You can. Uh, no, we did not. We just because we didn't need to. Maybe if we had a more uh, like a heparin sample, it might be more information informative. But this is just a linear polymer of glucuronic acid. We know what we put in and so we what we're going to get out. But, uh, okay, thank you guys. So now I think it's almost time. So we talked a lot of people about structures and functions and analysis, and all that and all that. Can feed them